Yeah, so my background, I want to highlight that first because I have a little bit of uh, history to come up. So I, I studied physics in, in Bochum in Germany, which is actually not too far from here. Um, yeah, you see it's, uh, it's a shocking long time ago. I did a PhD in an institute for neuroinformatic long before the field neuroinformatics was born. And I will comment on that a little bit. And then I spent uh, 13 years in, in the industry in uh, Honda, which is the car or motorcycle company, depending on your fancies. And then in 2011, I moved to the Blue Brain project. Uh, and currently, I'm working mostly uh, on the neurobotics part of the uh, human brain project. But along the way, since basically since my diploma work, I've been working on a neural simulator called Nest that some of you might know. And uh, I will refer to that a couple of times because practicalities mean you do something with it. So, yes? I guess I understood. I guess I understood your question. So you're asking what I was doing at Honda. Um, so we were trying to build a visual system like so many other people in the world. And uh, at one point, the management decided, well, when so many other people are doing it, why are we, why are we doing it? And why, what is our chance of being any better than uh, all the others that have been doing this for the last 50 years? And uh, I said, fair point, I go. <laughs> it wasn't quite as that, but in a way, I mean, if, if there's one inofficial advice that I would like or can give to a young modeler is keep away from the visual system. <laughs> the impact you're going to make is epsilon. <laughs> there's about 10,000 researchers doing this. <laughs> And your probability of being visible among these 10,000 is, well, unless you're a genius, probably very low. Yeah, so that's why I'm not doing any visual system anymore. And you have others that recognize your genius. I mean, that's uh, okay. So um, Nest is a simulator for large networks, and, and large always changes with the next computer generation, so I replace the number here by whatever fits into your computer's memory. People like to measure the efficacy or efficiency of simulators by the number of neurons, but that's really an irrelevant number because what really counts is the number of synapses because typically uh, each neuron has about 1,000 up to 10,000, some say even 100,000 synapses, and if, if each synapse eats up uh, a few bytes and a few differential equations to, to cover, then this actually outnumbers the neurons by orders of magnitude. So you don't really <coughs> worry about the number of neurons that you have. Um, the, the specialty of Nest is that it runs on a, a variety of different platforms, so single processor, multi-core, multi-processor, and supercomputers, which still are here clusters. And on top of that is a simulation language, which uh, is for most purposes nowadays Python. And I will go a little bit into that. And um, also Nest has a long history. Uh, and along the way... So, sorry, yeah. th does it also exploit um, graphic cards and uh, similar architectures or just with clusters? No, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't do any GPU processing now. The reason being that um, currently the, you always have to trade off development time uh, with usage time. Yeah? So how long does it take to develop a piece of code versus how long do you actually use it? Yeah? And GPUs currently have the advantage of being replaced very quickly, and the programming model also changes very quickly. And also, developing code for GPUs is very, uh, I would say, unstable, in the sense you make a minor modification and a tenfold speed up goes into a tenfold slowdown. Yeah, so it is not something that I would like to spend my time on until it has reached a state where you can 
really, you not only have a general purpose GPU, but you also have a general purpose programming model on top of a GPU that doesn't force you to buy into one of the few vendors that you have. Yeah, so there are a few projects where they, we, we try to use GPUs, but generally it tends to be not worth the effort currently. Um, so as you see, Nest has a long history, and along the way a lot of things happened, which I'm not listing here, but one thing is if you want to keep, that's also something for the practicalities, if you want to keep a piece of a tool, a piece of software alive, for a certain number of years, you have to make certain decisions uh, wisely. And wisely, of course, is a show-off term for you happen to be correct in retrospect. <laughs> but looking forward, you never know. <laughs> yeah, for example, when we started, things like QT and GTK, for the Linux geeks among you, this means the, the things you used to draw windows onto the screen, they didn't really exist. Every Unix variant had their own library for putting things onto the screen, and then we decided, okay, we are just not doing it because it's just too short-lived, not worth the effort, like with the GPUs nowadays. And that was a good decision because they said, okay, then we can focus on the things that, that are actually important and leave <coughs> the fancy displays to people who like to play with fancy displays. Um, and that has stayed like this, so now the graphics is done by Python, and they they do a much better job than we could. The only thing that we added at one point was parallelism and distributed computing, which from the perspective of the user is usually hidden. You don't have to worry about this. So you just say, I want to have so and so many neurons, so and so many connections. You will see this and so on. So the largest benchmark was last year when uh, we simulated a network corresponding to 1% uh, of the human brain on the K supercomputer in Kobe in Japan. That just means that this was a purely random network that in terms of the number of neurons and number of connections matched 1% of the human brain, nothing more. It, it wasn't doing anything, yeah? It wasn't really a brain in the sense. Okay, and uh, yeah, Nest is freely available, but most of you will know that. And I will now do uh, a jump back in time to catch up on this uh, problem or this term of neuroinformatics and I start with the origin of the word informatics which was uh, actually uh, coined by Karl Steinbuch, he's a German computer scientist but he actually meant it in the terms of, of it was very neural the way he meant it because he was uh, the inventor of what is called Lernmatrix, one of the first associative memory models um, in the late 50s, and he's kind of the founder uh, of what Kava Mead later called neuromorphic engineering. And uh, this is actually here, the publication from 1961 in a, in a journal called Kubernetic. Does anybody know what Kubernetic is called nowadays, this journal? It's biological cybernetics. And it was very new at that time and just replacing the biophysical journal as the prime publication spot for computational work. Anyway, so this is the memory matrix here and uh, basically you had little iron rings across wires to store information. Um, and anybody who will, will have followed the press, there was a recent announcement by IBM they published their true north architecture. And in effect, they're actually implementing uh, this idea here, also correctly citing it in modern hardware methods. Yeah. Um, so that's the term informatics. So basically, in, in Germany and many neighboring countries, informatic actually means computer science, nothing more, nothing less. Um, in the UK, I found this definition here from the University of Edinburgh, the study of the structure, and behavior interaction of natural and artificial computation systems. In the US, you get this somewhat vague definition, see application of information technology to the arts, sciences, and professions. I wouldn't really know what to expect in an informatics course. Uh, or the interdisciplinary study of the design application use impact of information technology. That sounds even more esoteric. 
Um, okay, yeah, and then in the late 80s, many European countries, I can't talk about the Americas, um, they use the term neuroinformatic, neuroinformatic, neuroinformatics to denote a field that nowadays would be called machine learning. Artificial neural networks, self-organizing maps, <coughs> backpropagation, all these things that, uh, that used to be fancy at that time. And still there are many universities today that use this name. Yeah, so in Germany there's a number that I know. There are some outside of Germany, Zurich for example. And then uh, I think the, the usage that we are kind of having in addition to that newly is what the US Human Brain Project adopted, uh, namely the terminology to, to bioinformatics, which is coarsely described as databasing the brain. Yeah, so neuroinformatics as such is, I would say, it's, it's an umbrella term for many things. So we should expect um, to have to deliver an explanation once we use it. Okay, and now I'm uh, fast forwarding again, and I want to elaborate on two concepts or two words we've heard a lot today. The first one is model, and the second one is simulation, and what the relation between the two could be. So I start with the model. Yeah, so if you Google for pictures of models, you find various different things. Yeah? And if somebody tells me you can't build a brain model, I would always say it's wrong, you can. And it's actually commercially very successful. You can make a lot of money with these things. Yeah? They won't recognize your images, but you can use them. They are useful in some sense. Yeah? So it's again, all models are wrong. Yeah? Some may be useful. OK, to be a bit more serious, there are certain classes of model, and if you restrict yourself to the scientific realm and not so much fashion, then we can dis distinguish uh, these categories which are not exclusive. Yeah? So you have what, is what I would call phenomenological models, which are, which are mathematical descriptions of phenomena or systems without referring to their constituent parts. And I would actually say that all fundamental laws of science are actually phenomenological models. If you take the equations of motion, for example, yeah, F equals MA, nobody tells you why this is so. There is no part in there, no mechanistic explanation why you would have this. And this is what particle physicists are struggling with, that uh, they're always looking further to find a mechanistic explanation or a principle that is so trivial that you don't need it anymore. But in a way, this is kind of your ideal model, provided that it doesn't have free parameters. Uh, then you have these mechanistic models, which is a level up. Yeah, so basically, if you have a system, you can break it down into mechanistic models down to the point where you're at the phenomenological level and you don't know any further. Yeah? And then there are the models where you actually can't look inside. These are these black box models that Jonathan has been talking about this morning, they are often statistical models where you basically use um, random variables and their distributions to describe the behavior of the system. But everybody is, is kind of well aware that this behavior comes about by some mechanism or whatever, so you can't really hope that you have discovered a fundamental law of nature here. Yeah? And often you have a combination of these and uh, so you can have a mechanistic model where certain parts are just probabilities or statistical things. And the question again is how useful is a model? Yeah? What, what are the criteria? And uh, I'm, I'm saying this a couple of times. So I think the most important one is that you describe the behavior of a system as you know it. This, uh, in a more precise form would be it should describe existing data or the data that you've put into <coughs> deducing your model. And it also should describe how the system behaves in new scenarios. Otherwise, you would just have a fancy way of uh, this saying what you already know. This is usually called generalization. Yeah? And I will uh, cover these two points here in a bit more detail. Um, 
you would also very often like to gain an understanding, in particular if you have a very complex system, you're really not happy if you have a model which accurately describes your system in every situation, but it's as complex as a real thing because you don't really learn anything. Yeah, so, and this is also important. You want to have as free parameters as possible. A free parameter is a parameter which you have to find by tuning in order to make the model match. I will give an example. Yeah, and optional provide a mechanistic understanding of the system. Yeah, if you are finding a law of nature, you get away without having this. So, to have an example, yeah, the gas equation that uh, Gauter already talked about. So you have this little relation here. So you have pressure, volume, and this is temperature, number of uh, material you have there, and this is the Reynolds number, and. In a way, this is a, it's a good model. It describes the behavior of, of gas under varying pressures and varying temperatures, but it doesn't really tell you why this is so, and it took Boltzmann a considerable effort to do so. Yeah, even there, the solution is so difficult that it doesn't really help you. Um, and it has one free parameter, namely this one here, but it <coughs> turns out that the same number shows up in other equations. So it's not really a free parameter anymore, but rather it's a fundamental constant, like the speed of light. And um, there are some observation here. Yeah? So this model here is certainly wrong, because there is no ideal gas around. But it's useful, because it's a very handy equation that you can use. Um, and you also see that there is no mechanistic understanding, really. I, I said that already. Yeah? So just to gauge a little bit the expectations um, about a model that one can have. So we now go to a pragmatic definition of what a model is. So for my purposes, it's always uh, basically you have some independent variables, which you call stimulus. If you're an experimenter, you have a system, you have some parameters that determine how you change the system, and you have an, a response. These are your dependent variables. And basically, a model is one function or a set of functions which describes your dependent variables as a function of the independent variables and the parameters that you put in. That's the, the most uh, basic definition of a model that, that one can give. And it doesn't really distinguish between uh, mechanistic, phenomenological, this would all be in, in the equation that you put in here. Yeah? So you can use a framework like the ones Jonathan described this morning or something else. An example, if you, for independent variables, these are the things you can actually um, vary. So you can choose the recording site if you take electrodes and poke them into a brain. You can modify the amplitude of a current that you inject into a neuron or something else. Or if you have visual experiments, the orientation of a moving light bar, the type of the visual object, position, direction of motion, you name it. The dependent variables are the ones you can measure, like membrane potentials at your recording site, spike rate of a, of a visually responsive neuron or of a whole area, absorption properties of voltage sensitive dyes at a cortical surface, for example, if you do optical imaging or time of spike relative to a theta phase if you're somebody in the hippocampus and looking at rats on a treadmill. Yeah, and for these you can build then models. And I will go back 110 years to this paper here. Yeah, that was the original integrated fire model, 1905, Louis Lapique. Yeah, and he um, basically observed the change of membrane potential in dependence of uh, a current that he, that he applied to a piece of membrane. And then he looked at different models that could describe this discharge. And of course, in the end, you wanted to get out that you have basically a capacitor and a resistor in parallel, which gives you this exponential rule here rather than this one, which the people had before. And these are the observed values, and these are the predicted values. And uh, initially, they're all similar in a way. But then if you look at uh, infinite 
charging times, then you will have uh, the better agreement with this formula here. Yeah. If you go to more complex uh, scenarios, you might look at things like this. So for example, you inject a current into a cell which has a noise shape here, and then you observe the response, which is a somatic membrane potential. And then you ask yourself, can you explain the response of the neuron based on the noise current that was supplied? And you can do modeling about this. And there was a paper where this is all summarized. It was actually a competition. So you can actually put these data sets out there. And the interesting thing is that the neuron model that won this competition was a generalized linear model, something similar, again, to what Jonathan talked about this morning. And also interesting was that no compartment model actually took, took part in the competition, which was a bit disappointing because the original idea was to see whether if you really give this, this type of benchmark, which one would give the best generalization. So the idea was you were given a certain number of these response traces and a certain number was held back for testing. So you could actually see how well your model generalized to the unseen data. Yeah. And this is uh, then giving us to the steps that you need to take if you want to do modeling, because you have two steps that you have to solve. The one is model selection. So which set of equations do you think is best to describe the response of your neuron in this case? And the other one is fitting of the free parameters. This is called fitting. So you have to find the best parameter set beta here for your model that you have. And this is basically the same problem that people have to solve in machine learning, because machine learning basically means that you use a neural network as a model for the input-output relations that should be learned. Yeah? And they formalized it nicely, so they said, OK, your data is always something like this. So it's a pairs of x and y. x is your stimulus, y is your response your independent and your dependent variables. And basically, you have to find for the model selection, model fitting. You first have to select your equations here. And then you basically minimize the difference between your model output and the actual data uh, on the basis of your parameters here. So you find the set of parameters that minimizes this least square expression here. And you can do some analysis on this. And there's a beautiful paper by Bienenstock and Giemann from 1981, if I'm not totally mistaken, on machine learning and the bias variance dilemma. And the bias variance dilemma um, comes about in various shapes. And I will come to that later, because I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. But I want to actually show this process here a little bit by another old paper here, <coughs> namely um, Gerstein and Mandelbrot. That's the same Mandelbrot that did the uh, little fractal figures that were so um, popular in the 90s. And it's a random walk model for the spike activity of a single neuron. So the idea was you observe spiking in an in vivo situation. It's very variable. We've seen that. And the question is, can you explain this variability? And the model they proposed was the following, that they said, OK, this is what we actually observe. This is time, and each of these dashes here is a spike. <coughs> and this is what, in statistics, it's called a point process. Failures of light bulbs, mining accidents, all these are point processes, radioactive decay. There is a, there's a whole mathematical framework. Let's see if we can use it. So I just introduce you a little bit to this framework. So basically, the idea is that a point process is a set of random points. These ti here are the various spike times here, only that these are random variables. So from one realization to the next, the spikes might be somewhere else. But the firing rate or the interval, the intervals between the spike, they follow certain common rules. Yeah? So this is a common mathematical description of a spike train by so-called delta functions here. They basically, a delta function is a function which just has a peak at the prescribed point in time. And the alternative way is that you look at the cumulative function where you integrate over this guy here. This looks like this. So whenever you have a spike, you will increase by a fixed amount. 
and so on. Yeah? And now, um, the idea is you want to have a process that basically describes how you get there. And this is the membrane potential equation that uh, people knew since Lapic. So this is a change of the potential as a function of time. This is a decay with a membrane time constant. And these are inputs that are coming in. And the idea is you have a certain number of excitatory inputs and a certain number of inhibitory inputs. The effect is, kept in, kept, uh, is captured by the J's that you have here. And these n's are the number of the cumulative number of spikes that the um, presynaptic neurons produced. Yeah, so the derivative will give you again these delta functions here. And the idea of the random walk is the following, that you say, OK, let's ignore the decay here. Let's assume that this time constant here is very large compared to the speed of the signals that are coming in and out. And then basically what we get is, is something like a random walk. And a random walk is basically this game here. Yeah? You take a coin and you start tossing the coin and you're making bets. Whenever there's head, you earn a dollar and whenever there's tail, you lose a dollar or a gulden or a euro. Yeah? And, uh, and then you ask yourself after n tosses of the coin, what is your cumulative winning? Yeah, and this process is a random walk. People have looked at this immensely because you can make money with it if you understand it correctly, if you go to the casino. And um, well, basically, this is a mathematical definition. But ma random walks have the interesting property that they are amazingly irregular. And that was what inspired Gerstein and Mandelbrot to take this as a source of variability in, in a neuron. So what you see here is the number of tosses that you have. Yeah? And the, each of these curves is one realization. So let's say you have 100 players that do this game. Yeah? So then this would be player 1, player 2, player 3, player 4, player 5. This is the average that you have. And what the first thing you notice is that none of the players is actually spending any time near the average. You're either completely losing or you're completely winning. And what you also notice is that the number of times you actually cross or reach the, the average, you cross the average, actually decreases with time. It becomes less and less likely that you will break even again. Yeah, so never play this. Um, <laughs> And this is illustrated here in this red curve, which is the standard deviation that you have across the population. And that is a mon monotonously increasing function. It goes with square root of the number of to uh, coin tosses that you do. And um, the, this is called the property of long leads, that you don't revisit the average. And it, it's a very striking uh, effect, which is quite counterintuitive. So if you read Feller, that's a very nice statistics introduction book. book. Um, so he writes, suppose that a great many coin tossing games are conducted simultaneously at a rate of one per second. Yeah, that's quite fast. Yeah? Day and night for a whole year. On average, in one out of 10 games, the last equalization will occur before nine days have passed. Yeah, this is, so basically after nine days, you've seen the last equal, and then you will be for the rest of the year completely in the plus or completely in the minus. Yeah? In one out of 20 cases, the last equalization takes place within uh, 21 fourth day. Yeah? And in one out of 100 cases, within the first two hours and 10 minutes. <coughs> yeah? So it's, it's amazing how counterintuitive that is. And this model makes predictions about the intervals. Because in a way, what you're doing is every time you cross the line here in, in the language of a neuron, that would be a threshold crossing in first approximation. There is, I will come to the, the catch. yeah. But you can then make out the interval distribution, which turns out to be like this. So this was one of the first computer simulations. Because at that time, <coughs> Even that you couldn't really do by hand. Yeah? 
And um, the model, of course, was a bit more complex because the threshold wasn't at zero, but they had a finite threshold which was here 32 steps above. You will see these are all numbers which are powers of two to make it feasible on a computer. You had 10,000 runs, which was a huge number at that time. And what you're doing here is basically a first passage time problem. Basically, you're looking at this particle until it hits, hits a wall, which is called absorber. And then basically, you go back to start and have to renew. And then they count the interval statistics. So this is the number of steps you have to wait until you reach the threshold. And this is the distribution you get out, which is a gamma distribution. And you can actually nicely fit it to the experimental data that they had at hand. So the conclusion at that time was, yes, the random walk model is a nice description of the uh, variability of the neural firing. Barry. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is actually really important right now in behavioral neuroscience and systems neuroscience because people are talking about how decision variables in a binary decision process are, are or are not fit by this model. And there must be 20 papers in the past year or two by substantially good algebraists dealing with this. And so if you want to look at something that's completely modern, go back and read all this old literature because it's all about first passage times and time to getting to the barrier and whether animals really obey this or not. And I think the, the original hardcore analysis of this was by Einstein for Schrodinger. Brownian in motion. Ah, yes, yes, for the... And the reason he did it was to prove that molecules exist. This was 1905. People still didn't believe there were molecules. OK. Um, there, is of, there is, of course, the one catch that we had that, the, that we neglected the time constant, or we made it infinitely large. What turns out is that the standard deviation gets bounded as soon as you have a finite time constant. So that limits the variability to a certain degree. And what we also don't learn here is why are the inputs to the neuron themselves random processes, as we have implicitly assumed here. So this is then more for the balanced model that Gaute talked about. OK, so the next step uh, or similar case is compartment neurons. And I would like to use compartment neurons to come back to this bias variance dilemma. That's a, a very fancy term. But it has very practical and very also very counterintuitive uh, effects. So compartment model, um, just to repeat, so this is a reconstruction of a neuron here. And for anybody who wants to see the synapses, they're actually sitting here. You know, there are these little things. And they are, the neurons are really covered with it from top to bottom. Um, and typically, the, the workflow is you take a neuron, you fill it with dye, and then under the microscope, you can reconstruct it. And then you try to find segments which have roughly the same diameter. And they will then be uh, translated into this equivalence cable model, where every, every of these sections here might be turned into one of these cables here. And that works under certain uh, assumptions which typically fit very well. So there's a nice body of literature that shows that you can very nicely uh, predict and describe what's happening in individual dendrites. Um, and then you turn it into this type of compartment model. Um, then you have your Hodgkin-Huxley equations on top to do the action potential that you have. But the Hodgkin-Huxley formalism did much more. It provided a mathematical framework for expressing ion channels that you can put in. And the interesting effect of ion channels is every ion channel you add to your membrane equation increases the complexity of your model description, of your neuron. Yeah? The more ion channels you have, the richer the dynamics of the equation is or are. And that has interesting uh, implications that I will come to. So first, um, 
Of course, first you need to have the morphology of a neuron. Yeah? Um, the electrical parameters attached to each compartment, which in some cases you can measure, in many cases you can't. That's why the old, or very old, meaning 80s, compartmental papers that you read, they will suffer the Noah's Ark problem, as I called it. Basically, you have two parameters from each species. Um, then the biggest unknown that you nowadays have is the number and the distribution of the ion channels across the cell membrane. This is, in a way, free parameter. Yeah, this is very hard to measure, actually. In particular, it's hard to measure if you have many cells. Yeah, you can do it maybe for one. If you're very tedious, it will take you a lifetime. But you certainly can't do it for an entire brain. And the model selection process is, in a way, finding the correct configuration of ion channels in each segment compartment, because that determines the number of equations that you have. And the number of equations, I told you, determines the richness of the dynamics that you have. Yeah? To give a very simple example, if you strip away all the ion channels, you just have the passive membrane left. You add a few ion channels, they give you a leak. And you add a few ion channels, you get a membrane potential. Uh, you get an action potential. You add a few ion channels, you might get bursting. You add another few channels, and then you might get H currents or whatever. Yeah? So there is a whole literature about the various effects that ion channels have. So that increases the capacity or the richness of your, of your model. And this is, in a way, is it a little problem because if you happen to have a model that is too complex for the data that you have, then you're not necessarily being better, quite the opposite. So in mathematical terms, usually uh, if you, have, you, you get different models, M1, M2, and up to Mn, and basically the, the diameter of the circle here is to illustrate the richness of the dynamics that you get. And basically, the more you have, the richer it gets. Yeah? And you wonder when, when is it time to stop. Yeah? And there's this very old guy from, I think, Oxford he was. He said, yeah, entita non sud multiplicanda preta necessitatem, which means you shouldn't multiply things unnecessarily. That was Ockham, William of Ockham. Um, and then there's this smart guy here who said things should be made as simple as possible with the catch, not any simpler. But as a theoretician, you would like to have a more formal description of that. So we jump back to a very simple example of, of the problem that we are facing. So let's say these dots here are your data points that you've measured from some neuron. Yeah? So you can make a, one model here, this straight line. It will basically miss most of the points. But if you add a new point, it probably won't miss the new point much worse than the other ones. Yeah, so you're basically a little bit, you're bad on everything, but not too bad. And you can have another model, which is very rich. In, in basically, it's a high-dimensional polynomial. It will hit each data point exactly, zero error. But you can be sure that the next data point will be missed greatly. And that tells us that the true solution here is probably somewhere in the middle. But the question is, where is it? And is there a way to actually determine where it is? And this is the, the, uh, the origin or the, the core of this bias variance dilemma. In the one case, yeah, you're putting a lot of bias into your model, a lot of knowledge, which gives you this one here. And in the other case, you have some variance left. Yeah, and you have to trade off between the two. You can't, you can't have it all. One is called underfitting. Your model has two degrees of freedom to describe the available data points. So you get a large error on the data that you're having. And overfitting, which means you have a beautiful reconstruction of the data that you put in to make your model, but you will be appalling on anything new. You won't generalize at all. It's actually not a good model. And you can actually show mathematically that there is an optimum somewhere. So you have two errors. One is called the empirical error. This is what you do on the data. That's the, the error your model makes on the data you put in to create the model. And then there is your actual error. That's the error your 
model makes in the field when it is exposed to new situations that it hasn't seen before. And this is the model capacity here. Yeah? So what is the dynamical richness of your model? And it turns out that both errors initially go down and the empirical error, as we've seen, eventually goes to zero. But the funny point is that the actual error actually goes up again. And it can become arbitrarily large. What's happening is that effectively you're modeling noise that you have in the data or in your system, or you're not modeling the noise, you're just being nice to the equations in a way, like in the polynomial case. Yeah? And um, in machine learning, this was realized some 10, 15 years ago, and there's a solution to this, and that turned out to be nowadays called support vector machines. They are built around finding this optimum here. And this is, of course, something that is not possible if you don't really know the equation. So you can't really come up with, a, with an optimal equation system for this. So we have to find other methods. And these are typically called cross-validation. If you look into the statistical literature, you will find a lot about this. Basically, what you do is you're taking your data set, which is sparse to begin with, and cut it into two halves. And the first half, you put away into a safe and never look at it. And the second half you use to make your model. And once you're happy with your model, you take out the first set of data from your safe, and you see whether your model is really as good as you think it is. And uh, basically, you're evaluating, again, these least square Errors here in good models should minimize both empirical and actual error. Yeah, you're probably missing the optimum, but at least you should be sure that you're not making anything worse by having too many parameters in your model. OK, so summary of this first part. Yeah, a theoretical model is a formal entity, usually expressed in words and equations. Um, a good model helps our understanding. Many models represent an ideal that cannot actually be reached by the physical system. That's a point that actually shouldn't be overstressed, um, which makes this model useful in some cases, but useless in other cases. For example, who knows the Carnot process? Who knows what that is? OK, that's a theoretical model for heat pumps, refrigerators, air conditioning systems. It's a beautiful model that tells us some limits of this. But if your refrigerator is broken, this model doesn't help you at all. Yeah? <laughs> and this is, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. If you talk about the human brain project and trying to simulate an entire brain, it's a difference whether I have a generic understanding how visual processing works, or I know exactly why this particular animal was blind. Yeah, this is, that's the difference between an abstract ideal model and a physical instance. I'm coming back to that. Um, yeah, but these models are nonetheless useful because they show the limits of the non-ideal physical system. Yeah, because every physical instance will be worse. So they are giving an upper limit, in this case, on the capacity of a heat machine, on computing, on whatever you can do with the gas. Yeah? And yeah, all models have a limited range of validity and must be checked against the, phys the original physical system. Um, yeah, or all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay. Now, after talking a lot about models, I'm coming now to the question, what is a simulation? And you can hardly see it. This is actually the, the column from the blue brain column, simulated. Yeah. Um, so, we are using, or I'm using the words almost all the time, simulation, model, almost interchangeably. But anyway, I, I took the trouble of looking up the word simulation in the Oxford English Dictionary, the definite record of the English language. So if they can't tell us. <laughs> so here, the action or practice of simulating with the intent to deceive, <laughs> false pretense, <laughs> deceitful profession. <laughs> Or the technique of imitating the behavior of some situation or process by means of suitably, suitably analogous situation or apparatus for the purpose of study or personnel training. And this is, I think this is our meaning here. Yeah, but yeah. And 
Huh? We are safe Probably not, yeah. <laughs> OK, so yeah, this is a model of flight, in this case lift. Yeah? And this is a simulation of it. You put it into a, you make it alive. Yeah? You're evaluating the equations on a computer. You can also do it by hand. Yeah? Solving the equations takes a lot of time. But these are also simulations here. You, I'm, I'm not sure whether we can switch off the lights here to make this a bit more. David, can, can you maybe switch off the lights, if possible? Ah, yeah, perfect. So you see here, this is actually a, a reproduction of the cockpit of a um, B747. Yeah, and this is what you would see out of the windows. This is a flight simulator. This is, of course, also a model. Um, but it's a very different one, and both are useful. Um, this one certainly doesn't tell you why it flies, but it flies in a way, at least convincingly enough that a pilot gets scared if he has to exercise in it. Um, and this one here will give you some understanding why it flies, even though whatever you have learned about why a plane goes up is probably the wrong explanation. Um, yeah, so simulation versus model. I stole this here from Wikipedia, computer model, but I liked it. So you have a real system and you make a model. Um, and then you have a model system. And the two kind of stand side by side. Yeah? And now you can perform simulation. You get some results. And you can compare it to improve the model. Yeah? And then you can also perform experiments on the real system. You get results. And that can go back into improving the model. Yeah? In parallel, you can also go ahead and make theoretical predictions. Actually, this also could be done on this side here. Yeah? So you can use real data and simulated data to make your theoretical predictions. And if you think carefully about it, a lot of the debate of the usefulness and uselessness of large-scale modeling is largely on the idea of whether they're useful for making theoretical models. And that's, of course, a question that nobody really answers. But just from the terminology here, yeah, so a computer model refers to the algorithms and equations. Yeah, so we're already a step behind the model. I will come to that. And the simulation is actually executing this with a piece of software. Yeah? So the workflow is something like this. So you have your abstract model. So you write down your equations. And now you have a computer model, and, and then you have a simulation. So a computer model means you have to translate your equations into algorithms and data structures. And that's a non-trivial process. And that's even com almost completely independent of the programming language you're using, or the compiler you're using, or the system you're using. It's really plain old computer science here. And then you have to implement the algorithm in your favorite programming language. And that's another step. Yeah? And then you have to run the program and check the results and probably start all over. And um, what I want to highlight a little bit is where in this process errors can come in. Because it's very easy to mistake whatever you get out here as a result of this one here, although you never looked back whether you've actually implemented this model or something completely different. To give an example, we start with two neurons. Yeah, so this is the equation here for an integrated and fire neuron. We've heard about it. So this is our membrane potential. This time it's called U for fun. No real reason. Um, and these are various currents which go in. Yeah? And this IS here is the synaptic current. And that's the question from that we had earlier. Basically, you subsume everything that happens at the synapse at this level into a little function here, which is called postsynaptic potential, which you might write as a simple delta function, in which case the postsynaptic potential will look like this. Or you can have more elaborate things. There's a lot of around. Yeah? And if this is your presynaptic uh, membrane potential, you inject a current, you will charge the membrane, and then will discharge once you switch the current off. We've seen this already. If you reach the threshold value here, you will produce an action potential, a spike. And this, dash, this, this spike is actually just cosmetic. I painted it on. It isn't actually in the equations here. The equations don't do this. 
Yeah? And then you get two spikes until you switch off the current, and then you don't make it anymore, and you decay back. Yeah? And these two spikes will look on these in the second neurons like this, given this thing here. Yeah? So this, let's assume this is our example brain, and we want to simulate this. Yeah? So you have these equations. And now your task is to turn this into a computer program. And uh, if everything works out now, I should be able to have the little program here. And where's my mouse? There's my mouse. So this is a piece of C++ code that actually does this. So you have a lot of numbers here. So these are our membrane potential. These synaptic uh, currents are actually stupidly called U. And there's an external current called I. Yeah, and then down here is the main. So these are all the parameters of my model. And then if I go a little bit down, which I can't. So if I go a little bit down, I have my main loop here. And basically, this is doing the whole logic here. This thing is evaluating the equations. And this thing is doing the transport of the spikes and everything. But it's very difficult to see, of course, because a lot of thinking has gone into it. So basically, the equations are solved here. Yeah, the first step was discovering that this type of equation can be solved analytically. So you don't have to do numerical. Uh, solving of differential equations. You just have to multiply by a constant factor. And this does the job for you. Here, you compare the membrane potential of your neuron against the threshold. And if you hit the threshold, then you reset the membrane potential to 0. And you tell the other neuron that there was a spike. And there must be a buffer that keeps the spikes while it is traveling along the axon, because there is a finite delay. And you somehow have to take care of this delay. So basically, this is the thing. It's a few lines of code. Um, <coughs> but the disadvantage is, if I now I'm changing my, my little example a little bit, basically everything of this will change as well. Yeah, and, and that's why uh, specialized tools have come around, which are called simulators, and which um, If you do this, so this was here our ad hoc version. Yeah? So basically, the computer model is a set. Of, I, I said this already. Yeah? So the computer model is implemented in C++. We've seen this. Yeah? And what we have to realize is that generally, a computer model is a lossy representation of your original model. Because computers can't really compute. This is one of their big faults. Yeah, just trying add up 0.1 sufficiently often, you will see that it will very quickly diverge from the correct answer. Also, any numerical solution of a differential equation, this is an easy case because it's analytically solvable. Yeah? But in the case of the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, if you have the Hodgkin-Huxley equations, for example, you will always have an error in your numerical solution. And sometimes it's not only the error that you have, but also whether a system of equations is stable or instable can depend on the type of numerical solution that you are using. The best example, which was kind of famous, was in climate research, where the equation system is mathematically stable, but as soon as you discretize it to simulate it on a computer, it becomes instable, which means that uh, basically the solutions that you get, the numbers, will go to infinity, positive or negative, which is something we typically don't observe uh, in a real climate. And in the 70s, somebody developed a little fix for that, but it took them 20 years to figure out why the fix worked, which is also interesting. OK, so um, in nests, is, the, uh, is that a numerical? Does it use numerical integration? It depends on the type of neuron model you're simulating. So Nest has many different many different neuron models. Some, so every neuron model that can be solved explicitly is solved explicitly. Right. The only problem that is still remaining, if you have uh, 
So basically what every simulator does, even neuron genesis or moose, whenever it comes to sending a spike from one neuron to the next, you have to detect a threshold. <coughs> and this detection of the threshold crossing is very uh, prone to errors. Yeah, because you can't really afford to do a bisection and, and really find it precisely, but you rather get a little interval. And sometimes this interval can be very large. Yeah, if you imagine a curve that very um, smoothly approaches your detection threshold, then tiny errors will, will move you a long distance on the time axis. Yeah, and this huge error in the spike time is, is then, of course, propagating. If you have a recurrent network, it typically has a chaotic dynamic. And that will mean one spike moved by a millisecond will change the network trajectory uh, considerably. Is there an actual fix for that that was in, is implemented? Well, you, you can do certain fixes, but, well, they will, they, they will, they will uh, improve the accuracy, but uh, it's a fundamental mathematical problem of root finding, yeah? And you have to trade off between the accuracy and the speed, yeah? If you have a million neurons to care about, and every spike uh, will take you a millisecond to... to to uh, determine it precisely, that's simply, oh, we're getting there. But, uh, do you also think in the brain that small fluctuations also could trigger the threshold, trigger a, a spike? So in the brain, certainly it does. Yeah, I w but um, there is, ah, nice. So there is one, um, so you, you very often hear the argument, you don't have to be precise with your simulation or your model because the brain is also imprecise. And this is a very bad argument because noise in the brain is very often unbiased. Unfortunately, mathematical errors don't do you this favor. They are not unbiased. They give you a bias in a certain direction. Yeah, for example, a spike might always come a little bit too late and not also a little bit too early. Yeah? And, and very often you have this, or your, your error is in fixed multiples of your integration time step. And that you will quickly see these types of biases. Wouldn't add an unbiased source of noise, like white noise maybe fix part of the problem? Maybe. But you would probably have a long way to go to prove that it is indeed the case. But if, if, if we have a model and we, we can just try to validate it and not so much, or at least not in the first step, yeah. actually justify the... So what, what you can do is you can, you can make theoretical models that make certain assumptions of this sort, yeah, and then you can use it for validation. But typically, um, the, the rule is if you have an equation, try to solve it as good as possible. That's the, the safe bet. Otherwise, you would have to... Um, you would really have to show that whatever you're doing is, is not introducing any artifacts. Um, yeah, so if you still remember the code, you will see that the model, these two neurons, the synapse or whatever, was only implicitly, uh, implicitly represented in the code. Most of what you saw actually did something else, like initializing parameters and running a loop and whatever. So the corresponding nest version is this one here. Yeah, so this is, I don't have to switch. So basically you create two neurons, it's actually called, and this is the name of the neuron model as a naming convention, which I'm not going into here. There is a tool that helps me to measure the membrane potential so I can nicely visualize it. And then I have uh, neuron one, which gets an external current of 1,000 picoampere. I have a voltmeter and I tell it how often to record the membrane potential. I connect the two neurons, I connect my voltmeter to my neuron and let the time run for 100 milliseconds. So here you, uh, you still have a few lines, but you see what's happening and then you get the nice tool. And the advantage here also is that with basically one or few lines, you can change the neuron model you're looking at. So whether you want to have the Itzikiewicz model and Hodgkin-Huxley model or whatever, it's still the same 
surrounding code. It's just one line that gives you the model, or two lines that gives you the model here. And I want to make a, a stronger case here by looking at a more complex example, namely this one here, um, or basically a model that describes this one. So it's, it's uh, a model for what is called delay period activity. So this is recordings here from a monkey, not from a model. And these are three seconds. The monkey is given a cue and then some signal. Then there's a delay period here. And then it has to respond. And this is here. And basically, this neuron here at the queue increases its firing rate, which you can also see in the individual traces here. And then the firing rate stays elevated for roughly two seconds here. And there is no stimulus presence whatsoever during this period. So the, the neuron just decides to stay up. And once the monkey has responded, it goes down again. And the question is, how does a network actually do this? Yeah, how can you switch a network on and off? And there's a number of uh, papers that has investigated this. The idea is you have a recurrent network, and this recurrent network can change basically the firing rates. And the standard model that has been proposed is this one. You have two populations, an excitatory population and an inhibitory population. And population here means the neurons are basically doing the same thing. And there's some background activity. So our populations are sitting somewhere in the larger brain. And they are bombarded by spikes. And that's a model put forward by Amit and Brunel and Nicola Brunel in yeah, roughly 10, 15 years ago. And if you look at the system and you play a little bit with the ratio between excitation and inhibition, this is subsumed in this factor G here, you see that the network goes through various states, and one state is what is called the asynchronous irregular regime. Yeah, there are other regimes which are mainly oscillatory or very sparse, depending on this, so that was very interesting, and it has become something like a standard model for network dynamics based on this original question. <coughs> and the um, question is, can you reproduce this? Yeah? So the the model is actually 10,000 excitatory neurons to 1,500 inhibitory neurons, around about 15 million connections. Basically, the network description is a few sentences. It's very compact in English. Yeah? And um, I can come up with an ad hoc version in Python or in um, or in C++, I think I have the Python version here. It is this one. So again, you have a lot of variables which are initialized. And this is our main loop here. And it doesn't really look too much different than the other one. Um, it only takes a huge amount of memory. It takes a huge amount of time. And it doesn't even produce the right result. And I spent the morning trying to figure out what the error is, but I couldn't because this type of code is not really debuggable. This, <laughs> yeah, and this is coming from me, right? Um, anyway, <laughs> anyway the, uh, the corresponding nest version, which of course I will not uh, take away from you. Um, well, OK, so you have, <laughs> this is my statement here again. Yeah, so it runs actually very slow. I was surprised how slow it is. The program takes, yeah, that was a lot of memory some time ago. It isn't nowadays. But the, the conclusion is that if you're inexperienced, you're likely to choose the wrong algorithms and the wrong data structures. Um, and this is also the reason why the version was so bad. Yeah, so this is the, the nest version here. Uh, it's roughly the same number of lines of code. Again, you can, you can actually read it and see, for example, here that you're creating 10,000 of these uh, neurons here and not one, like in the previous case, and these are our inhibitory neurons. You have a Poisson generator, which uh, creates the background spikes. You have a spike detector, which reads the spikes. And these are our connections here, which have different strengths. So the excitatory connections have 0.1 millivolt, and these ones here minus 0.5 millivolts. This is part of the model. And then you connect them, and this uh, well, the textual description is actually roughly the same, which says. Can you put in the distribution of weights if you want? Yeah. Okay. Now you can with the new release. 
Otherwise, you would have to do it in, in uh, Python. But now it's, uh, but here I just use a fixed, uh, fixed weight because this is what the model calls for. And here again, I say I simulate. And then I get uh, this output here. And just to give you an idea, um, how long that runs. So this is here my thing, and I should be able to just, oh, this is the ad hoc. Let's take the other one. Yeah, I can just uh, call it here. And so now nest is loaded, and it connects. And then it simulates. And so these are 15 million connections, and now it plots the results, and they show up on this screen, which are here. Yeah. And then also, in principle, you can inspect the data that you get out of this. Yeah. Just as a, I can just, uh, just for the fun of it, if I start my ad hoc version here, yeah, it, it never comes to an end. It takes 10 minutes or something like this before it goes anywhere. So um, of course, you can make a C++ version that will be faster. Um, OK, so How long did it take you to write that and debug it in Nest? To write that, well, that's difficult to say because this is an example we keep around for for fifteen years now. Okay. Yeah. So basically, so you but don't remember writing it. I remember writing it actually. I reverse engineered it from a C version that somebody gave me, and I wrote it on the train from Frankfurt to Göttingen. So it took me like three hours. To, but, but that involved reverse engineering it from the, uh, from the C code, which was a much larger piece because it was distributed code. And then I cross-checked it with the, with the original reference. Yeah, but it's, it's relatively straightforward because the, um, the connections are the difficult part. Because basically, Brunel says each neuron gets input from 10% of the excitatory and inhibitory neurons. That's a sentence. And that's basically exactly what we've done here. The syntax was a bit different at that time, but basically it's a one-liner. <coughs> um, OK, so the, the, again, the nest version is more explicit because it uses domain-specific commands. Um, you can relatively easily change the different parts. and. Um, the, the useful thing is that the common infrastructures like buffers, numerical solutions, they are basically hidden from you. Yeah, there is a question back there. Could you please run the second one, second simulation? It's still running. Yeah, the second, parallel. Let's compare the results. The parallel. With two different simulations. Uh, is it possible? I'm not sure what you actually mean now. I mean, let's. Let's do two different simulation and compare the results. Ah, no, it will always be the same result. Yeah? If you, yes, because, because what Nest does is it, it takes control of all the random number generators. And actually, Nest has a test, a batch of tests, uh, tests that run through. And they will actually check that the, the results are to a very high, pre actually to machine precision, identical between runs. Yeah, so I will. Come to that a little bit. I will, I will uh, come back to that point. But yeah, I told you the C++ version has a bug. Um. <laughs> yeah, um, we can look at the result, but the firing rate is not correct. That comes out, and there's some. I don't know. I, I looked at it for a few hours, when, and I got fed up. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so simulations are lo-fi representations of your models, and you should always remember this. Yeah? If you have a fancy equation and you put it into a computer system, it turns into something rather nasty. Um, 
And there are several sources of errors. So you can have semantic errors in the computer model, various types. So for example, you simply could have chosen the wrong numeric algorithm for your equation, and it turns out to be unstable under certain configurations. If you look through the neuron code, for example, there is a huge number of specific tests that check that the solution is not running away. There could be, of course, programming errors in the implementation, which uh, you probably never make. Um, there could be numerical behavior, yeah, uh, numerical errors, simply due to machine precision, and this accumulates in a chaotic system. And then there could be, of course, errors in the system behavior, which result from the first two, three, uh, first three points. And my experience is that we, we as humans, and I'm not excluding myself, we have the tendency to invent stories about beautiful pictures, uh, why they are useful, um, before we question the correctness of our results. And I've seen this over and over again, and I'm seeing this at I, a student, a co-worker, comes with a nice picture. We say, yeah, this is so because, only to figure out later that we just had an error in the code. Yeah, so cross-checking, yeah, unit testing here. Unit testing really means that you find little control cases where you exactly know what is supposed to come out. They might be as trivial as B. Yeah? For example, if you have a neuron model and you inject a finite current, which is a sub-threshold, then for simple neuron models, your membrane potential should saturate at some value. That value you can typically compute, and that is, would be one test. I mean, these are all just little punctual tests, but in cumulation, they help you to uh, get better. So Nest actually has a battery of, I think, now almost 300 tests that run through that test the most important models and features. And uh, these tests are often written that they work for a range of different simulation step sizes. This is also one of the critical points that you do a uh, wrong sampling. So actually Nest was then accordingly also praised here that uh, for many cases Nest was equivalent to the reference up to rounding errors. Yeah? So it wasn't shown in the comparison here of different uh, <coughs> simulation tools. And I'm putting up this warning simply because errors in software can have severe effects. So this is a paper from Science reporting that five science and nature papers had to be retracted <coughs> because of errors in their self-written simulation code. It was actually very bad because the paper that had the errors prevented the publication of other papers which were probably correct. So one has to be very careful here. Yeah, so this is the kind of final picture on that thing here. Yeah, so you have, you have your real system, your experiment, and you construct a model around it, and then you construct a, an implementation. And there are two steps here which are crucial. The one is the model building step, and the other one is the simulation building step, the computer model building step. And they are separate things. And many people like to put them into one bowl. I yeah, so when people talk about model sharing in uh, INCF context, they usually mean simulation models of some sort. And this is another issue here. Yeah, so simulations are computer implementations of models. And this translation process is always lossy because computers have a finite precision, whereas mathematical objects typically have infinite precision. Um, so in that sense, a model, a simulation is a model of a model in a way. Yeah? So you have to validate it against the original model. That's, that's difficult. OK, that brings me here to another step, which is remarks on reproducibility, which in the context of INCF is very important. There are many people, even in some publications, that mistake reproducibility with rerunability. That's not the same thing. Scientific progress comes about by Barry giving me a result, and I'm redoing the experiment myself and get the same result. It doesn't mean that I go to his laboratory, use his tools and his equipment, and get the same results. 
Yeah? And model sharing very often has this implicit idea of I give you my software and then you can just start over again. But this has always the danger of just proliferating and propagating the error that others have already made. So if you rerun simulation code, this is not reproducible research. Yeah? It just means that your code is running. It doesn't mean that the model that's implemented there is actually correct. Yeah? So if you really want to reproduce a simulation result, you have to go through the painful step of taking the, the theoretical model and doing your own implementation. Or you have to use very well-validated tools that do this. Yeah? So simulation code may be useful, yeah, but only if it's used to re-implement rather than rerun the model. You can use it as a, as a guideline, yeah, but not <coughs> as a real starting point. Yeah? And, and maybe as a sanity check, I mean, this is also with respect to model, to code sharing when it comes to simulation. I mean, how often do you read your own code and how good are you actually in reading your own code? I mean, most code, we know that is not shared for the fact because the authors think it's, it's basically write only. Yeah? So you've written your MATLAB, Excel, IDL, Python script and you find it works, but you find it too appalling to show it to anybody else. It's a little bit, it's a little bit like your you know, the, the little cabinet you have in your bathroom where all the cleaning materials are. Yeah? You never have anybody look at that. It's probably the same here. Okay, so that concludes my talk. I'm almost on time. I would have five slides on the, on the Human Brain Project, but uh, that only if there is time and interest. Otherwise, we can keep it for maybe the forum tomorrow. Thank you. re-emphasize what Mark Oliver just said. And it may be even worse in experimental labs than in computational labs. I'm not uh, glad to hear that. <laughs> no, no, it's just a horrible problem. People doing experiments that are too complicated or too difficult to think about reproducing. And I work at a place where I have to justify why I go to even small things like this. And one of the statements I make all the time, because they, the funding agencies are terrified of the following, which is I put in a justification that says I'm going so that I'm up with the state of the field and that we're not going to um, unnecessarily duplicate previously done experiments. I'm very careful to put in the word unnecessary. Yeah, yeah, I was just about to because say. Because it is so critical to reproduce. And frequently, when we do an experiment, we build in re reproducing some either previous experiment of our own or of someone else's. Because you have very little to compare to if yeah. you don't do that. And it's a disaster how many times it doesn't work. And this is, unfortunately, a very hot issue. That I think politically there's going to be a lot of pressure to, make sure, to come up with standards that make it more likely that we can all repro reproduce, not just re-simulate yeah. our results. But the pressure is always going to be there not to duplicate what you've done already. And those two things are just in, in going to end up in a dynamic tug of war all the time. So. <clears throat> okay. Thanks. Uh, what are the, difference bet the differences between uh, the, the nest and the, the genesis and the, the neuron and the other one? Okay. Yeah. So. I start with ne uh, neuron and genesis. So neuron and genesis are simulators for compartmental neuron models. And as the name neuron indicates, it was actually written to simulate one neuron. Whereas nest sits a level above, and the idea always was to simulate large networks where the effect 
of the individual neural morphologies are largely washed out. Yeah. So now in the in the context of, of the of the human brain project, the, the these levels are going to be connected. Yeah, but uh, the the thing is at the network level, you can do different optimizations than if you, if you do single compartment models. And that's why Nest is, la is faster for networks, even if you're doing the same level of abstraction. On the other hand, if you did want to do compartment models with Nest, that would be extremely tedious, even if it is possible. So they all have their realm, but they sit at different uh, graining levels of the, of the brain. Okay, um, should I run through this few HBP slides, or is that something? <laughs> okay. Um, in fact, it's, it's, there's one slide which, which, in my view, says it all, but it's always difficult to explain it. And I'm also, in retrospect, I'm, I'm not happy that the word data appears here. So the idea is basically you have data, you make a model, and, and then you validate the model, and then you're looking for new data. But data is a very abstract term. And in particular with big data and data mining, it has, it has a funny flavor because it means it's a bunch of numbers or a bunch of information, and then you have some magic tools which turns this bunch of numbers into a gold mine of some sort. Yeah, this is not the data that I mean here. The data that I mean here is actual uh, data that describes a system. So in fact, this should be model dis uh, system description. So for example, if I give you this room here and I want to fill it with furniture, you will take a rule measure and you start measuring the length of the walls and tell me where the windows are and tell me where the electrical lines are and the plumbing and whatever. This is a type of system description that I'm talking about. Yeah? Numbers that you can get about the brain that describe the brain at all the possible measurable dimensions. I'm not talking about data which I cannot yet interpret. That's a different set of data. Yeah? So for example, if I Think about the first talk from today where we had this nice image slices and so on, and they tell me where the synapses are and where the neurons are. This is the type of data that I'm talking about. Data that quantitatively describes what is where in the brain, for example. And there are many data sets like this out there, yeah? but they are not really used. And the question is, and that's one of the basic questions you can ask is, if you take all these types of quantitative data, can you build a computer model of the brain from it? And how far do you actually get with what you have? Because one of the biggest problems we have currently in neuroscience is that we don't really know what we know and what we don't know. Yeah, so the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns <laughs> as a famous American <laughs> defense minister <laughs> used to say, they are completely unclear. Yeah? So, and in a way, it's, um, it's a data integration project. And the, the nice, so, so the, the, the typical question is, what is a good metaphor for it? And, and uh, many people in my lab, they say, you, you want to build a microscope for the brain. So you can look deeper into it and whatever, or a telescope or whatever. And I think that's actually a bad metaphor because it expects an outcome once you're done. Whereas if you're in the cycle, you're getting an immediate outcome. Namely, you know what you don't know in the sense that you can always see where your model fails. And in that sense, a bad model is always better than no model. Yeah? And the first attempt where this was actually done was in 1496. 93, I'm lying. Yeah, here. So this is Beheim's Erdapfel. This was the first globe ever produced. I have a physical photo of it. And it took together all the different maps that people had drawn and tried to arrange it on an empty sphere. Yeah? It's called Earth Apple because the word globe didn't exist yet. Yeah, it was just about to be invented. And this is the modern version that we have, Google Earth. There are some 500 years in between. 
It's also something to um, get our expectations right here. Yeah. So Martin Beheim, he did this. He integrated basically all available knowledge. So this is a real thing. Again, if we switch off the light, we maybe see a bit more. The top, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so it, yeah, it stands about this high. Um, and one of the biggest tasks was actually taking these maps and they had to be aligned and registered to a common coordinate system. It's the same thing you have to do with neuroscience data nowadays. And also if you look here, there are other pictures on the web if you're interested, that it, it's filled with encyclopedic information about what you would actually find there. Most of it was wrong because never, nobody had ever been there, but still um, it was quite useful. And also if you look at this one here, you will see here is Ireland, England, this is Spain, Africa. This here is Katai, that's an old name for China. Somewhere here we should expect Japan and there's a big void in between. Yeah. And at that time actually it was known that there is something in between, namely Americas. But it wasn't known whether it's just an island or a few islands <coughs> and, or a whole continent. So it's actually not put, put in here. Yeah. But nonetheless, it was a useful exercise yeah, because it really delivered a con consistent view about the knowledge of the Earth in this case. And what we can expect from the HPP is a consistent view of the knowledge of the brain. I will give an example yeah, where you basically fit each piece of information into a coherent global picture. And the first version, of course, can't be perfect. Yeah? So in the case of the globe, it took 500 years to arrive at something like Google Earth, and we're still not done. Yeah? Um, at least we know how far the knowledge stretches. And so the strategy is that you try to build a tool chain that uses descriptive data to reconstruct the brain in silico. Yeah? So it's a mixture between, you could, you could see it as a living brain atlas that stretches various levels, where you can make the different parts alive in, in terms of a simulation. And that also means that on the structural level you have neurons, maybe you have connections depending on how much data you get. But the interesting point is that the type of models you use to populate your, or to animate the individual cells and synapses or whatever, they're of course not fixed, you can change them. And that's also a way of hypothesis testing that otherwise isn't possible. And since you start with a relatively low complexity, you are relatively sure that you're not overfitting here and uh, any further data can improve the model. So the artistic rendering that you get from this is this one here. Where's my mouse? So this is actually a video. Yeah. So this is uh, what we got out of the Allen Brain data here. Um, and it's, I use it here to illustrate what, what we actually want to do. So you take data at various levels from various sources, and then you build, in a way, a voxel-based database where at each position you actually know exactly what's inside. And why do you want to have it voxel-based? Because you can turn it into a simulation model. And then you can label it additionally with semantic information which sits on top. So for example, you can know how many cells you would have per unit space and how many of these cells are neuron and how many is glia, how many fibers you have and so on. And all these data sets are in a way also, at least when it comes to space, mutually exclusive. That is, if there's a neuron, there can't be a fiber, right? I mean, because they would have to take up the same space. If it is a neuron, it can't be a glia cell and so on. So whatever data sets you combine, they will mutually constrain each other. And you can relatively quickly arrive at a nonsensical uh, simulation of this. So you can use cell densities to create or to populate a brain model. This is downsampled here. Um, the color code here is the uh, annotation which brain region we are talking about. And then at least for some cells, it's, it's rel they are relatively good models to synthesize the morphologies. Others, you can actually take canned morphologies from experiments. There are various uh, studies that tell you how 
at least certain regions are connected, DTI or tracer injections, and then you can have a very coarse, at least at the level of point neurons, a simulation of this. So this can be done relatively quickly. And then the next step is, and this is also interesting, to actually observe the brain in its natural habitat. That is, put an animal or a virtual animal around it. And this is what the neurobotics part is about, to have, um, have the brain also attached to a body with somatosensory input, whisker input, optical input, and so on. OK, so this is just roughly as, a, as an outline. So uh, in a way, it is a, a tool to integrate data and to see where new data is actually needed. That's the um, shortest summary that I can come up with. Thank you. So maybe, to, maybe just real quick, um, what is Nest's role in the Human Brain Project? So Nest, uh, Nest is the, the, the tool that will be used for the point neuron level simulations. Is, so, it this, is it a single tool or will they? No, no, that's, it's a whole. So the, the strategy is to have multi-scale. So um, at the lowest level, I think it's M cell and steps, then comes neuron, then comes nest. And I'm not sure if there's something above. I can't recall that. He was. Most of the data comes from uh, either rat or mouse or anything. But like, if you see in the long term how we compare with the human brain, it may be, it may we may realize that what we saw is not happening in human brain. No. Yeah. So the that's that's a very uh, common comment from the from the perspective of this tool chain here that that the HBP is focusing on, it's completely agnostic with respect to the species that you're looking at. Yeah, because all you have is space that you populate, and then you create a model. Initially, mouse is convenient because A, there's a lot of data, and B, it is small. Yeah, so even if we wanted to, we couldn't do a human brain at that level right now. It's simply not possible, simply because of the amount of data that you would need and the amount of computation time to simulate these types of models. But the idea is you sharpen your tool using the mouse, and then you reboot with human data. Yeah, but uh, it will not be straightforward, right? So in uh, year-wise, how, how it will go? Like, can you predict something? OK. What's like a pipeline or something? So from my perspective, it will probably be much easier because by then the imaging techniques will have improved a great deal. But how, I'm not able to say that right now. Yeah, it's, it's, if, you, if you consider the genome project as an analogy, the first few sequences, they took forever. Yeah? And then suddenly the tools were so improved that you could sequence within a few days what took months before. Yeah? And if you look at... If you look at the advantage in imaging that we have, it's, it's tremendous what is happening there. So I suspect, for example, we already have this, this big brain data set from Katrin Amunds in, in Jülich, which is very high resolution. But currently, it, it doesn't really make sense to use it because it would simply out, uh, outsize any of the equipment that we have and would artificially uh, drag us down. So. I think from, at least from the, from the methods that we're using now, it's not a difference whether you use a mouse, a monkey, or any other mammal, as long as you're not talking about insects. Uh, you, now in this last picture that you showed with the eventual simulation of the mouse in the, by the robotics department, yeah. I wonder, um, this, this, what you're developing right now is for simulating the brain, the CNS. Uh, 
and I wonder if there's any steps taken to also model the peripheral uh, nervous system and then the integration with this uh, mechanical part, uh, this environment. Yes, yes. So, yeah, yeah, maybe I wasn't clear. So this, this, this tool chain is completely agnostic with respect mm -hmm. to what part of the brain is done. It's mm -hmm. the entire brain. Mm -hmm. The only problem is that in this particular data set from the Allen Brain Institute, the eyes are chopped off. Yeah, so we have to kind of artificially reattach the eyes and there's also no spinal cord. Yeah, so this is, is actually a big problem because what we want to do is really to, um, let's put it the other way around. If you ha let's say you have a complete brain model, yeah, but it's completely deafferented. Yeah, what are you going to expect? It's very difficult, yeah, but it's an interesting question actually and also highlights a little bit where there's a, there's a big bit of cortex chauvinism. We know a lot about cortex, but we know very little about most of the other structures. And if I, for example, talk to the neuroprosthetics people or spinal cord people that want to do spinal cord injury recovery, they are complaining that not enough people are actually looking at these structures because everybody thinks they want to understand cognition when you don't even know how to re-instantiate uh, walking. And, and considering that, wouldn't it also be, isn't already the mouse too ambitious of a project? How can a project be too ambitious? <laughs> what I mean, I mean in the sense that right now tackling the problem of the mouse seems like a wiser decision than go already for the brain because of the dimension. And I wonder if, considering we need, still need to take into account the peri peripheral and even the environment, yeah. wouldn't it be, make more sense to go to even lower order organisms? Like? Um, C. elegans or something. Like <laughs> yeah, but I mean, these animals were completely different. So the nice thing about the mouse is you have all these genetic manipulations that you can do, yeah? And also in terms of, for example, the, the, um, if you talk about the peripheral nervous system and so on, it's also a model that is used for spinal cord injury and, and neuroprosthetics. And in that sense, it's actually a very nice model to work with. And the connection, for example, spinal cord models, you can, you can relate. I'm, I'm really, really confident that you can relatively nicely validate them because there's a lot you can measure along the way from the muscles, spinal cord, neuromuscular junction, and so on. So it is difficult, but again, um, every model will be wrong that you get. Yeah? The question is, do you learn something from the model? This is a real point, and one has to emphasize what do you actually learn? And I think... Um, the biggest benefit in the current stage of, of our field is that these types of models should guide us where the next experiments should go. Because this is one of the biggest failures of current computational neuroscience. It doesn't guide experiments. It's in a way very selfish because it's, it's solely focusing on getting an abstract idea on visual processing, whatever processing. And now, now Barry has to jump in, of course. Yeah, all I was going to say is, I agree with you, there's not enough communication. Um, and on the other side of the coin, the experimentalists, as a rule, are not very keen to yeah. spend their time uh, answering a question for because a simulation came out a particular way, or a model says something. I mean, the experimentalists have their own ideas, yeah. and there's a real cultural um, separation here that needs somehow to be overcome. I mean, there's a lot of effort, and there are a lot of places where you see things are changing. But when you examine them carefully, they're not changing as much or as quickly as I would have thought they would. It's a real problem. I think Jonathan wants to. Wash my head. <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's a bit of an open. It's a bit of an open-ended question, and maybe something that's better better uh, for dinner or something. But but uh, so in in the first part of your talk, you, you know, you, you made some very very important things about overfitting and underfitting, and about yeah. stability. Uh, for example, when you try to simulate a differential equation with finite time steps, yeah. um, and that it's real important to sort of be in control of these things, and, and one has very good theoretical tools for knowing when you get into trouble. I mean, still not perfect, yeah. but good theoretical tools. So I think a lot of people are kind of worried that one does a, a large-scale simulation with large numbers of parameters, including unknown, unknown 
parameters. Yeah. Uh, that how do you have how do you have a control over overfitting versus underfitting? Um, uh, uh, network size effects, robustness to getting the model, you know, exactly right versus just like structural stability. You know, to yeah. use a technical term. I think I think this is uh, very important, but one has to, I think one has to learn how to deal with this because one of the biggest problems we're currently facing is the following, that the brain is an integrated system. It solves many, many tasks, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes one after the other. Any given model of whatever brain function you think about is an isolated model. And we have as yet no idea how to make all these models coexist into a single system. Yeah? So even if we had perfect models of vision, audition, touch, you name it, we wouldn't be able to reconcile it in, in an actual brain. Because Occam's razor tells us to leave out anything that is not part of this task that we are looking at. So this task of, of how do you actually do this? Yeah? How do you how do you how do you populate a model that is actually bound to overfit in a way that it's not overfitting? Somehow the brain solves that task. And my only answer is I don't know how to do it. We have to be aware that this problem exists. And we must get away in this project from the idea that the results we are getting represent a scientific news in the sense that we've discovered a phenomenon rather than that we probably discovered another mismatch to reality. Yeah? So experiment, of course, is the ultimate judge of what is doing. So it is not so that a particular simulation result in, in a positive sense will guide an experiment, but rather that a particular negative simulation result will make us aware of data that is urgently needed. This is my current prediction. Of course, if you talk to me in a year from now, that might be completely different. Yeah, uh, well, I think, uh, I think these, these are really important issues, and it also has this important sociological aspect. I think Leiden is also known, at least that's what I've been told, this is, it was the first first uh, place, university in Europe, or university anyway, who got a particular or dedicated professor in theoretical physics. Before they were professor of physics, but then they, like in physics there's been like this division of labor between theory and experiments for, for 100 years, because it just realized it's just too difficult to do these things, I mean for one person to do both. So in typical physics departments, you maybe now have like, I don't know, 50-50 of people doing like, we call it theory, but it's sort of modeling and people doing experiments. And of course, it's very tightly interact. They have like similar educations, but nevertheless, they specialize in different things because these techniques are different. Uh, probably in neuroscience, I would guess maybe like 1% of the scientists uh, could be called theoreticians. And I, I personally think that this really, this has to change. But it's also a, like a sociological experiment. How, how, how will, this is sort of like, a, probably some of you heard about this, this, this discussion about the Human Brain Project, uh, which is sort of interesting because it's, it's, it's also, it's many, many things which are about these things which are sort of interesting. But I think it's also interesting that the first time I ever heard about that somebody starts a petition against another project is actually sort of against this Minority project, after all, about like this, this, this of this, this, this new techniques going Although in. Although there was, there was for the uh, genome project, there was a very similar mm. petition, which was actually much larger mm. because it was a mass letter to the representatives. But uh, but anyway, the so this, the point is that there's all this, this, this both not only is this a scientifically hard problem, it's also sociologically yeah. a very hard, hard problem because a lot of uh, because it's there was this story that about the people who started quantum physics. They were asked, well, 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 how did you convince all these people who were trained in classical physics that about quantum physics? And they said, well, we didn't. They just died out. <laughs> it's, it's very just difficult for people to change their opinions. 
And I think that's the same thing it's going to be, have to be in neuroscience, this sort of this, this new techniques. So it's like the people are sort of like, like them dominating the field, to deciding what should be funded. And generally will be this, people have like, don't know about these opportunities in neuroinformatics. And that's what sort of what society, to go to Obama, that's what change looks like. That, that's sort of, this is what change looks like in, in neuroscience. I think it's just, uh, it's very, that's why it's very important, I think, for the new people who come in, like you, to have this more, like, op open view and open, and, and also the background to make, to make sort of, yeah. to think about these things. I mean, the, 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 you said it's a minority project, and that's actually an interesting point, because, I mean, the Human Brain Project gets one billion over 10 years. The neuroscience funding in Europe is nine billion per year. Now, the petition said we should distribute the money from the HBP to the traditional research funding, which would hardly make a difference if you do the math, because basically you would add 50 million to uh, 9 billion, or 100 million to 9 billion. So it's, it's relatively small change that you would actually make. The one in the US has the same problem. It's the NIH, this isn't even all U.S. agencies. The NIH alone, the NIH alone gives between five and a half and six billion a year to neuroscience. And they were talking about a hundred million dollars. Well, you know, it's not even one percent. And another interesting thing is so a quote that I heard from a famous cognitive neuroscientist is that we have to do new experiment because we can't trust the old data. But if you really digest this argument, yeah, it really means why should you do experiments at all? <laughs> yeah, because it's, it's a time invariant argument. You could put it on any place on the time axis, which means Next week, you will also say that the data you produced last week is not trustworthy. Yeah, I mean, then there's something fundamentally wrong in the way either we produce data or we treat the data or we design our experiments. There used to be my... <laughs> Sorry, I want to ask the question that is not related to the cost. Because I can see that you are connected to human brain mapping. Human brain mapping? No. Human brain mapping projects. No. Okay. Yeah, what because I want... Because that, that's uh, the American version, right? It's no, the European no. fashion. Is that... No. So I'm, so I'm working at the Blue Brain Project in the HBP and my... My, yes. actually, my, main, my main working field I is... I mean, human brain project, sorry. Yeah. Ah, human brain project, yes. Yeah, yeah. because uh, there was uh, critics about the... From, uh, there was a uh, critics from some neuroscientists. Yeah. So on the human brain project, I, know, I want to know about your position. Well, yeah, part of the position we just discussed, uh, I mean, the other, the other maybe more uh, faster to lunch answer is the following. The EU wanted to have a high-risk, ambitionary or visionary project. And there were 26 original contestants, and then there were six contestants left after a first round of two years or so. And then there was another two years, and four were left, and then finally two were selected. Now the EU has two high-risk, visionary projects, and after six years of going through a public uh, competition. Why now complain about the project being high risk? Uh, 